Hi everyone, this lesson is on fetal alcohol syndrome. In this lesson, we're going to talk about this condition in depth. So we're going to talk about some of the risk factors for getting this condition. We're also going to talk about some of the pathophysiology behind why and how it occurs. We're also going to talk about the signs and symptoms, so the characteristic findings that we can see in patients with fetal alcohol syndrome. And then we're going to talk about the diagnosis and treatment of this condition. So fetal alcohol syndrome, or FAS, is a condition that occurs in the developing fetus that is caused by maternal consumption of alcohol during pregnancy. So it is a condition that occurs during pregnancy when the fetus's mother consumes alcohol during pregnancy. It can occur at conception or it can occur throughout pregnancy. And it causes a wide variety of characteristic facial findings, neurological issues, and also some other skeletal abnormalities, which we're going to talk about later on in this lesson. And this condition is caused by consumption of alcohol during pregnancy, so it doesn't matter what type of alcohol is consumed or how much is consumed. There is no safe level of alcohol consumption during pregnancy. And exposure to alcohol during pregnancy can lead to a spectrum of conditions, which is known as the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, or FASD. And fetal alcohol syndrome is actually only one of the conditions that occurs in the spectrum, but it is the most severe form. So we're going to mostly focus on fetal alcohol syndrome in this lesson, but the other disorders that can occur in the spectrum include alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, or ARND, alcohol-related birth defects, or ARBD, neurobehavioral disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure, or NDPAE, partial fetal alcohol syndrome, or PFAS, and then fetal alcohol syndrome, or FAS, which is, again, the most severe form. So fetal alcohol syndrome is estimated to affect 0.1% of pregnancies, but the spectrum itself that covers all of these conditions is estimated to affect 1% of pregnancies. And fetal alcohol syndrome is so important to recognize and attempt to prevent because it is the most common cause of preventable intellectual disability. So very important to recognize this condition and try to prevent it. Let's talk about the risk factors for getting fetal alcohol syndrome. So what is required to actually have this condition is maternal consumption of alcohol during pregnancy, but there are other factors that can increase the risk of this condition occurring. So they're all mostly going to be related to alcohol consumption. So one of them is going to be an increased dose of alcohol consumption. So if the mother is consuming large amounts of alcohol, that's going to increase the risk of fetal alcohol syndrome occurring and the risk occurs in a dose-dependent manner. So as there is increasing maternal consumption of alcohol throughout the pregnancy, the risk for having this condition increases. Another factor that can increase the risk for this condition occurring is if the pregnant patient is greater than the age of 30 and they have a chronic alcohol consumption history. Now, interestingly, there is a pattern of alcohol consumption that increases the risk of fetal alcohol syndrome, and that is actually heavy episodic or binge consumption of alcohol. So this particular pattern of consumption of alcohol is the pattern that's going to most likely cause fetal alcohol syndrome. A maternal genetic susceptibility to reduced alcohol metabolism is also another risk factor. You can imagine that if the mother has a particular genetic susceptibility to not metabolizing alcohol efficiently enough, alcohol levels can rise and this can increase the risk for fetal alcohol syndrome occurring. Maternal malnutrition is also another risk factor. And then having a previous infant with fetal alcohol syndrome is another risk factor. So as is common in medicine, having a past history of an occurrence increases the risk for that same thing occurring in the future. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of fetal alcohol syndrome. So when there is maternal consumption of alcohol, and ethanol is the type of alcohol that humans consume, it's important to note that ethanol itself is a neurotoxin. It is toxic to brain neurons, and it's toxic even in adult patients. And what happens is that in the mother, the ethanol is metabolized into an intermediary known as acetaldehyde, which is itself another neurotoxin. So both ethanol and acetaldehyde are neurotoxins. And the problem is, is that these two can easily cross the placental barrier. They can enter into fetal tissues. And they are, in fact, teratogenic during all three trimesters of pregnancy. So teratogenic meaning that ethanol and acetaldehyde can interfere with proper embryonic development and cause abnormalities in the developing fetus. So the ethanol and acetaldehyde cross the placenta and enter into the developing fetus's tissues. And one of the most important parts of the fetal tissues that are affected is the central nervous system. There is detrimental effects to the central nervous system, but other parts of the developing fetus as well. In the central nervous system, though, this causes irreversible damage. It damages those brain neurons that we talked about before. So 
because ethanol and acetaldehyde are both neurotoxins, they cause damage to the developing central nervous system in the fetus. And you can imagine that ethanol and acetaldehyde are both neurotoxins even in fully formed adults. It's going to have detrimental effects in the developing fetus. And the problem is, is that when looking at the fetus in the mother, there are equal ethanol levels. So whatever is found in the mother is also going to be found in the fetus. So you can imagine the detrimental effects that can occur. The fetus itself most exclusively relies on the mother for liver metabolism of the ethanol. So there is actually limited liver metabolism in the fetus. Only about 10% of it gets processed by the fetus. And then the amniotic fluid itself can also act as a reservoir for the ethanol and acetaldehyde. So even after maternal ethanol consumption is completed, there still can be some ethanol floating around in the amniotic fluid that can lead to more and more damage to the developing fetus. Now, not only do ethanol and acetaldehyde affect the central nervous system, but they can have wide-ranging effects on many other processes in the developing fetus. One of them is going to be that they both cause dysregulated cell differentiation and migration. This is a very important process in the developing fetus, so any dysregulation in this process is going to be detrimental to the fetus. They can also lead to disruption of DNA and protein synthesis, and they can also lead to impaired macronutrient metabolism, so they can impair the metabolism of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and they can also impede proper placental transport of these macronutrients and other nutrients like zinc as well. So all of these effects are going to lead to a suppression or an impaired growth of the fetus. And ethanol consumption has been found to have long-lasting dysregulation on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or the HPA axis, which is going to lead to issues with stress regulation in the fetus, infant, and developing child later on in life. So those are most of the effects that can occur in fetal alcohol syndrome, but there are particular effects that can occur depending on the trimester in which there is maternal consumption of alcohol. So in the first trimester, if there is ethanol exposure during the first trimester, this is most commonly going to be associated with facial morphological changes and certain brain abnormalities. In the second trimester, ethanol exposure is going to increase the risk of spontaneous abortion. And in the third trimester, ethanol exposure is more likely to cause reduced height and weight of the fetus and reduced brain volume. So these are some of the effects that can occur depending on the trimester that the fetus is exposed to ethanol. Let's talk about the clinical features of fetal alcohol syndrome. We mentioned early on in this lesson that there are particular characteristic findings of fetal alcohol syndrome, and they're broken down into three main categories. One is going to be facial morphological changes. The other category is going to be growth restriction. As I mentioned before, a lot of those pathophysiological mechanisms can lead to reduced growth of the fetus. And then the third is going to be cognitive and neurological issues or changes or abnormalities. And again, this all ties in with the pathophysiology we talked about before. Ethanol is a neurotoxin and can lead to toxic effects to neurons in the central nervous system. So we'll first talk about facial morphology changes. So the facial morphology of fetal alcohol syndrome patients is going to have particular characteristics. One of them is that they're often going to have small eye openings with skin folds at the corner of the eyes. So you can see in this image here, the eye openings are very small. So patients with fetal alcohol syndrome are often going to have microphthalmia, which is a medical term for having small eyes. They're more likely to also have short palpebral fissures which are less than the 10th percentile. So palpebral fissures are the distance between the corners of the eyes. They're more likely to also have ptosis. Ptosis is a drooping of an eyelid, so they can have it on one side or both sides. They're also likely to have strabismus, so one eye is not aligned properly and it can cause issues with vision. They're more likely to also have mid-face hypoplasia or a small mid-face. They can also have small head circumference. They can have a short nose, low nasal bridge, and they can also have a smooth philtrum. A philtrum is the groove between the lip and the nose. So this is a philtrum here. And in this image, this patient has fetal alcohol syndrome and it is smooth or absent. And they can also have a thin upper lip. So you can see in this image here, we can see some of the findings we just talked about, small eye openings, a smooth philtrum, and a thin upper lip. So a lot of the changes is going to lead to a smaller head size, small mid-face, a reduced or absent philtrum, small eye sizes, small nose, and a thin upper lip. Those are going to be some of the highlights of the characteristic findings in facial morphology.
So in line with some of those smaller features is growth restriction. So growth restriction is going to be fetal or intrauterine growth restriction. This is defined as less than the 10th percentile for gestational age or weighing less than 2,500 grams at full term. So those are the definitions for fetal or intrauterine growth restriction. If you want more information on fetal growth restriction, please check out my full lesson on this topic. But nevertheless, fetal alcohol syndrome is one of those causes of fetal growth restriction. This makes sense in the context of the pathophysiology of this condition. Along with the fetal growth restriction, there may also be reduced postnatal growth. So even after delivery of the baby, the baby can be slow to grow. There can be reduced postnatal growth. And fetal growth restriction can not only have short-term health consequences, but can also have long-term health consequences, such as increased risk of cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, and other consequences as well. If you want more information, again, please check out my full lesson on this topic. And then moving on to cognitive and neurological features of fetal alcohol syndrome, we're going to more likely see microcephaly. Microcephaly is a small sized head. We mentioned again that there's often going to be a small head circumference. So the brain can often be smaller than average. Along with this, there can be intellectual impairment. The intellectual impairment is often going to be mild to moderate. It's not going to often be severe, but there can be mild to moderate impairments. There's also going to be developmental delay. So we can see learning disabilities. We can see issues with completion of high school. We can see issues with academic achievement. There's also an increased risk of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in childhood with these patients. There can also be behavioral issues. So this can translate into irritability during infancy, and there can also be an increased risk for impulsivity and other problematic behaviors that occur throughout life. Seizures can also be something that is associated with fetal alcohol syndrome as well. And when looking at the brain itself, there are particular anatomical anomalies in the brain, including corpus callosum agenesis or hypoplasia. So the corpus callosum is the bundle of neural connections between the two hemispheres of the brain. And in patients with fetal alcohol syndrome, this can often be a characteristic brain anomaly that is taught in school, that the corpus callosum is absent or missing, or it's smaller than average. So you can imagine not having that bundle of connections between the two hemispheres is going to cause issues with cognition and other intellectual abilities. And then there can also be reduced or delayed myelination of neurons. The myelin is this fatty sheath that overlies the axons of neurons to help with neuronal transmission. So if there's reduced or delayed myelination of neurons, this can also play a role in some of these effects we talked about here as well. So although I mentioned that those are the three main categories of clinical findings in fetal alcohol syndrome, there are other features that are more likely to occur in patients with fetal alcohol syndrome. These include hand and arm abnormalities, which include radio ulnar synostosis, camptodactyly. Camptodactyly is having a bent finger, so it's a bent finger out of the plane of the other fingers. Clinodactyly, which is a bent finger in the plane of the other fingers. So you can see in this image here, this is clinodactyly. There can also be abnormal palmar creases, and patients with fetal alcohol syndrome are more likely to have flexion contractures, which can be found in the fingers, but also in other parts of the body as well. And along with these abnormalities, there can also be other skeletal abnormalities that can be more often found in fetal alcohol syndrome patients. One of these is scoliosis. So scoliosis is an S-shaped spine. We can also see clipophile anomaly more likely in these patients. Hemivertebrae can also be found in these patients. And other abnormalities that can be found in patients with fetal alcohol syndrome include a cleft palate, certain heart defects, renal defects, hearing loss, and vision issues. So all of these can be found in fetal alcohol syndrome patients. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose and treat fetal alcohol syndrome. So the diagnosis is going to often require evidence of maternal consumption of alcohol during pregnancy. It's not always going to be present, however, as a lot of patients may not admit to having consumed alcohol during pregnancy. Nonetheless, though, the diagnosis is going to be clinical diagnosis through examining the patient and seeing if there's presence of characteristics in those three diagnostic or symptom domains we talked about before. So if there are those characteristic facial morphology changes we talked about before, if there are neurodevelopmental or CNS abnormalities, and if there's growth restriction, which could be prenatal or postnatal. So if characteristics are present in these three domains, and especially if there is evidence of maternal consumption of alcohol, that is going to be the diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome. But again, in some cases, there may not be evidence of maternal consumption of alcohol, but if there is any suspicion or if there are these hallmark findings in these three 
domains that can often also be enough to make the diagnosis as well. And I also want to mention partial fetal alcohol syndrome as it is very similar to fetal alcohol syndrome, but it doesn't require all of these three domains. It only requires having some facial morphological abnormalities. So there has to be at least some of those facial morphological changes we talked about before. And then some neurodevelopmental abnormalities, growth restriction, or other unexplained behavioral or neurological anomalies. So a patient doesn't have to have all of these anomalies, but they have to have at least one of these three with those facial morphological abnormalities, and best if there's also evidence of maternal consumption to make the diagnosis of partial fetal alcohol syndrome. Once a clinician has diagnosed this condition, how is it treated? So because this is an irreversible condition, there is no effective treatments. It's going to be supportive treatments for the patient. So these are going to include educating the parents and the family. So educating the parents and family on some of the possible issues that can arise in these patients. Educational supports for the child with fetal alcohol syndrome can be helpful as well. Again, we mentioned that there's going to be learning disability. There can be developmental delay. Having proper educational supports is going to be helpful. And then family supports, helping the family with the child who has fetal alcohol syndrome is going to be very important. And then there is question of whether or not certain medications may be helpful, especially in children who have ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but this is still questionable. But because the treatments are so limited, again, the best treatment is going to be prevention of this from occurring in the first place. So avoiding all alcohol consumption during pregnancy is going to be key in preventing this from occurring in the first place. If you want to learn more about other obstetrical and gynecological conditions, please check out my playlist on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.